1970, at the Pechensky district of the Kola Peninsula, the Soviet Union started to dig a hole. The project had one major purpose, to see how far down we could get and what would happen when we got there. This project would continue for the next 20 years and result in the deepest hole ever dug. The 12,262-metre, 7.6-mile Kola Superdeep Borehole SG3 still exists today, just sitting in the middle of an abandoned scientific site as a capped-off tube protruding from the ground. Projects like this have provided us with a deeper understanding of our planet's geological makeup, some of which is now being used to inform a different, more practical purpose of harnessing geothermal energy. This would provide an almost limitless source of clean, green energy that, with today's technology, could easily deliver enough power to satisfy the world's needs. The problem, though, is getting at it. While this might seem straightforward at first, in practice, it is not. Cutting through the billions of years old hyperdense rock at staggering temperatures and pressures provides unique challenges that need to be overcome. However, a few companies now believe they have the answer to digging deep and are actively in the works to develop the first geothermal power plants toward the end of the decade. They claim this is the only real challenger to nuclear and truly green alternative to the high-polluting coal, oil and gas industries. But how are they doing this? And what technologies are being developed to facilitate this real journey to the center of the Earth? Today, the world has 80% oil and gas and 20% clean, and that 20% is mostly nuclear and hydroelectric. So you're just gonna bring geothermal into that mix and replace the 80% oil, in my opinion, and just replace it by geothermal. You can still have 10% nuclear and 10% hydro. All right, let's start with the basics. Geothermal energy is the heat that originates from the Earth's core. It's like the planet's own battery. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. And that heat can be harnessed to generate electricity or even to heat buildings directly. Deep in the Earth's core, molten rock and minerals reach temperatures exceeding 1100 degrees centigrade or 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. In volcanic areas such as Iceland, hot rocks are much closer to the surface and geothermal energy has been part of the energy mix for decades. This involves drilling into the Earth's crust to reach those hot rocks, circulating water through them and using the resulting steam to power turbines. The outcome? Clean, renewable energy. However, drilling into the Earth's crust isn't exactly a walk in the park. We're talking about drilling several kilometers deep, sometimes up to 10 kilometers or more, and that's no easy feat. Gabriel Mayer, a scientist at the Laboratory of Experimental Rock Mechanics at EPFL, explains. You have to picture that when you're getting deeper into the crust, the pressure and the temperature within the crust is increasing dramatically. On average, on Earth, you will increase pressure by the, the weight of the rock that is above your head. So that would be about uh, 25, 30 MPa megapascals per kilometer. And the temperature would be between 25 and 30 degrees on average per kilometer as well. So the deeper you go and the greater the pressure and the greater the temperature. Drilling to great depths into the Earth's crust has unique problems. This will obviously take a toll on your tools, the drilly bits, but you also have like the deeper you go and the taller your, your drilling column is, your drilling line and it can buckle under its own weight. The, the, the weight of this line can break the, the drill bit. From the fluids perspective, because when you drill, you have to, to have drilling muds to flow out the cuttings. The deeper you go and the greater the pressure you will have to maintain within your uh, borehole to flow those cuttings out, but also to maintain the borehole open. Because of course, if you increase the pressure and the temperature, the rock, within which your borehole is being dug will deform and it, it can break, it can, it can collapse on itself. The conditions that you find underneath our feet are so extreme that our tools are very unadapted to, 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 to dig any deeper. The materials used for drilling must also withstand immense pressure and corrosion from the hot rock and water. Additionally, the deeper you go, the more complex the geology becomes. Different rocks, fractures, and even faults can make drilling unpredictable. 
If you ask a child to draw uh, what's beneath our feet, he would draw probably some lava, something red, something flowy, something liquid. This is not actually what you have under your feet, it is solid rock. But as you go down, the solid rock experiences greater pressure and greater temperature. And it goes from a mechanical behavior that we call brittle, it breaks like glass, it shatters, to something that is ductile. So in this case, the rock is flowing when, when you strain it, when you stress it, when it deforms, it flows rather than breaking. An image you could, you could use that is somewhat inaccurate but can help illustrate what actually happens is that you go from some really brittle chocolate at, at room temperature that you can snap, you can break it into squares, to something more like a fudge that you can deform without really breaking. Gabrielle has been researching this area in the lab and has discovered that very hot ductile rock can be permeated by water because of microfissures. This means water in contact with these rocks deep within the Earth's crust can become supercritical. So supercritical water is water that is uh, at a temperature above 373 Celsius and at pressures above 220 bars. Now the key there is that when your water is in this supercritical state, it is much more energy dense. You extract much more energy per unit mass of water you get. But to, to reach this, uh, this physical state of the water, you need temperature above 373 degrees. And this depth is reached quite deep in the crust. On average, we talk about five kilometers, five to 10 kilometers. Now, the key is that supercritical water could multiply the output of conventional geothermal by a factor of 10. So it's huge. To create supercritical water, you must drill many kilometers to reach temperatures between 300 and 500 C. That's the sort of temperature you get when burning fossil fuels. We spoke to Carlos Arak, the CEO of Quays Energy, a company developing new and innovative ways of deep drilling for geothermal energy use. We're trying to get to 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. Those are not very high temperatures by any means. Pizza ovens are right up there. Uh, but they're, they're not the typical oil and gas temperatures. Oil and gas usually is 200 degrees Celsius or less. So there's work to do with respect to increasing the temperature rating of tools. The second one is the depth. We need to go three to 20 kilometers. Three, four, five kilometers is quite typical. No problem for oil and gas. As you start to get into 10, it starts to be doable, but hard and expensive. And anything much beyond 10 is pretty much impossible. The Russians are the only ones who have gone to 12 kilometers and it took 20 years. So it's a question of toolkit availability and needs to upgrade. And there's a question of pushing the frontiers of what's possible with deep drilling. But deep drilling has one big drawback. The challenge in going that deep is that you can get energy down there to do the job. You basically are rotating a spaghetti string from the surface of a drill rig. And by the time you're five, six, seven, 10 kilometers down, very little of that energy actually gets down there to do the work. You're barely scraping the rock. So, if we are going to harness the energy from deep in the Earth's crust, how will we reach it? We're going to drill not with drill bits or by rotating pipe, but by injecting an energy beam, a microwave energy beam up to a megawatt, and we're just going to transfer that energy from the surface to the bottom of the hole. It goes at the speed of light, and it packs a punch. It basically breaks that rock, vaporizes that rock on contact, and that does the work of retrieving the rock. The second thing is economics. You know, as you go deeper, the drill bits wear very quickly, and replacing them is very costly because you're paying the drilling rig $100,000 per day, and you're spending a lot of time not drilling, but replacing drill bits. So by moving away from drill bits that wear into energy that doesn't wear, um, you actually change the economics radically. You bend the cost curve. The nearest equivalent to the Quay's energy technique is fiber optics. The big difference here is that our waveguides are not fiber optics. They're much bigger. They're three to four inch diameter. They're metallic. And instead of using lasers, which pack a milliwatt of energy, we use a microwave, which packs a megawatt. Other than that, it's quite similar. There are two boreholes for each geothermal location. So we use two holes. There's usually one going each way. There's an injector where you put water into the, into the subsurface. 
and there's a producer which takes the heated water, usually in the supercritical or compressed liquid condition, but very, very hot, uh, back out to the surface and into whatever you're trying to use that heat for. It could be a power plant, for example. So interestingly enough, the thermal siphon effect, the fact that a cold column of water is heavier than a hot column of water, does the pumping for you. You actually don't have to pump at all. It pumps itself. And the deeper and the hotter you go, the more extreme the pumping action is. This new technology could significantly reduce drilling time and costs, potentially opening up geothermal energy to previously inaccessible regions. Quasar started testing its drilling technology in Texas. It plans to have at least one plant operating by the decade's end. However, this advanced drilling isn't the only method of geothermal energy capture being developed. Fervo Energy is focused on creating geothermal power generation using drilling techniques similar to those used in the fracking industry. Quinn Woodard Jr., the director of surface facilities, explains how Fervo Energy's technology works. Essentially, we are drilling a horizontal well, which, which has a vertical component, where we're targeting depths of about 8,500 feet, and then we drill a lateral portion as well, uh, what we classify as a doublet, which is an injector pair and a producer. Uh, those wells are intersecting, they have intersecting fractures. You pump down hot fluid, you pump down fluid, which is then swept across uh, the hot rocks and then produced uh, and then sent to a power plant to generate power. The goal is to make geothermal as scalable as wind or solar power, providing substantial clean energy wherever needed. Fervo is already testing pilot plants in places like Utah and is working on scaling geothermal energy to a commercial level. However, there is a caveat. From a power plant perspective, uh, we want to minimize uh, the, the number of solids that are, are going to our plant. Uh, we want to ensure that, you know, we don't have silica or scaling that occurs. And so geology does play a portion of it. Again, you have, you know, hot oil and gas wells uh, that are produced. We don't want we don't want the hydrocarbons. We're looking for water. Uh, we're looking for hot rocks. And so there are some limitations. But again, the flexibility uh, for, for next generation geothermal uh, expands much past to where the zones we're targeting for our first uh, developments here in the U.S. If these companies succeed, we could see geothermal energy becoming one of the most reliable, sustainable power sources in the world. Our first development of Cape Station in Utah, uh, essentially it's a, it's a 90 megawatt offtake and when we're designing our plant, we'll have, we'll have additional megawatts available. Uh, that's an asset that could power hundreds of thousands of homes, somewhere in the uppers of 400,000 plus, plus homes. Um, and, and again, when you couple that across 30 year life cycle, uh, that's a that's a great uh, win for for surrounding areas and and where our offtake is positioned. Currently, traditional geothermal plants are located near tectonic plate boundaries such as Iceland, New Zealand, and parts of the United States. But the future, it's not just about volcanic hotspots. New technology could harness geothermal energy in more locations than ever before. When we look at geothermal, when we look at next generation geothermal. You know, if I can just simplify it from a facility standpoint, you know, the, the main components are generators, turbines, heat exchangers, vessels, pumps, et cetera. This equipment has been around for, for decades, centuries, you know, and, and, and ORC is nothing new. The techniques that we're now applying to, to EGS, Enhanced Geothermal, have been around as well. And, and the, the ability to put gigawatts at scale on the grid is very much capable and doable today. In fact, the world's geothermal potential could meet all of our energy needs. If we can unlock just a fraction of it, we're looking at an energy source that's both sustainable and incredibly powerful. Some estimates suggest geothermal energy could provide up to 20% of global electricity demand, and the proponents suggest more. That's massive, and it could work alongside other renewables like solar and wind, delivering reliable 24-7 power, something that intermittent sources can't always guarantee. One thing that I always stress, because these things sound very complicated, is why bother? Why, do, why not just do wind, solar, and batteries? And I have nothing against them, but uh, I think they distract from the true problem and scale of energy transition. When we talk about wind, solar, and batteries, um, many, many issues will prevent them from scaling to the, to the level we need. So they become uh, a thing that gives us the illusion of progress uh, while the 
world continues to increase emissions year after year after year. So that is why we need to do the kind of thing that we're talking about here. We need bold solutions for the massive problem that energy transition implies. We cannot be so distracted with the little solutions. So let's address the big question. Can geothermal replace nuclear power? Both geothermal and nuclear energy can produce substantial base power. However, geothermal has a clear advantage in terms of safety and waste. Unlike nuclear, which generates long-lasting radioactive waste, geothermal is clean and doesn't leave behind harmful byproducts. We drill the well and then we pump down water. This water typically goes in the range of, of 80 C, right? So it's, it's at the end of the rejection cycle of the plant. It's pumped down at a high pressure, high flow. It's sweeping the rock and then it's coming up at 200 C. It then goes to a ORC, organic ranking cycle binary plant. And then it, it hits an inlet at the heat exchanger and you have a working fluid of a lower boiling pressure. That's then vaporized and sent to the turbine to spin and, and generate power. And then the cycle is condensed off and then you have the water re-injected, which essentially is a, a closed loop process. Additionally, geothermal power plants are smaller and don't require the same safety measures as nuclear plants. Yet geothermal faces one challenge in this competition, scale. While nuclear power can generate massive amounts of energy from a single plant, geothermal's energy's output is still limited by the availability of accessible hot rock. That said, with advancements from companies like Quays and Fervo, we might see geothermal's output scale to nuclear level capacity. In the same way that we speak today of 80% primary energy being oil and gas, I like to think of geothermal being 80% of primary energy supply uh, 25 to 50 years in the future. Turning to geothermal energy is, in other words, the journey to the center of the Earth for the 21st century. Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.